Yes. All right, great. Well, thank you. And I'd like to join everyone else in uh, thanking Active Motifs uh, for this conference and keeping us all uh, up to date during uh, COVID. And I think it goes really just beyond this conference that Active Motifs has really been um, making science fun when things got really seemingly hard, especially with the cool t-shirts and um, podcasts and all sorts of resources for people to kind of pick and choose um, topics. They're, they're interested in staying up to date when the world was kind of um, shut down. So thank you very much in general for, for everything you guys have been doing to keep um, the science world still fun. Um, and with that, I'd, uh, I'll start to uh, introduce my talk here where this is what the human um, genome looked like when I was a grad student. Um, and we knew about 5% of the sequence, um, which is roughly about the land mass of Australia on earth. And in, in that time, for, for decades, we've known that there's these mysterious RNA machines that do critical processes in our cells. For example, telomerase is an RNA-based RNA, RNA -based machine where the RNA plays a central role in extending our telomeres and preventing aging and cancer. Uh, the ribosome, which makes all the proteins in our cell, is actually an RNA machine and catalytically active as a ribozyme and exists, uh, plays as an RNA, an important role in um, dosage compensation between XX and XY genotypes. And so as the genome was sequenced, we saw all these new areas where genes could be. And we also found that there was many more of these non-coding RNAs. But this just really raised the next question, which is which of any of these RNAs actually represent one of these classic um, RNA machines. And so we've spent uh, the past, 12 or so years to find that and have kind of sifted this down to a few. And I just want to talk to you about one today, um, a gene uh, we call FIRE. So the approach we took um, in, in the field was to use genetics. And uh, I like to say genetics is the biology of, or the math of biology, um, or I think Ed Lewis said it better, that genetics is never dependent on knowing what a gene is chemically and would hold true if it was made of green cheese. I think what he's trying to say here is that if you remove a genetic element and there's a phenotype, it's, it's great. It's either DNA, RNA, or protein, um, and you just have to dig in. But having a phenotype is really where you want to start. And so we heeded uh, Ed Lewis's advice, but with thousands of candidates out there, um, we wanted to use some criterion to kind of get to something that would represent one of these classic um, already known RNA machines. So first thing would be nice is that they're conserved so we could use a mouse model to see what happens and then we can maybe relate that to human biology. There are many long non-coding RNAs and we've published on them that are just in mouse and not in human. Um, and so we thought it's an important first step to make sure it's in both species. And uh, FIRE uh, stands for Functional Energetic Repeating RNA Element um, and has a beautiful locus where you can see a nice promoter region, uh, gene body, with uh, different histone marks. And notably, which will come into play here, is CTCF is rampant across this locus. Most gene bodies don't have this much CTCF in them. Um, in the mouse, we see the same situation. Nice promoter gene body, multi-exonic transcript. Um, it's localized on the, located on the X chromosome, quite a ways away from exist. Again, caked in CTCF in human and mouse. So it's conserved, that's good. Um, and we can look at that to make sure it's not a protein. There's a couple approaches we've been using. Um, one I really like that's, that's almost, you can just look in the genome browser and tell if there's a small peptide hiding in your favorite RNA. Um, and that's phylo CSF, which stands for codon substitution frequency. And what this is measuring is the classic property in proteins that if mutations occur throughout evolution, they're gonna try and preserve the correct type of amino acid. So for instance, an alanine going to a glycine is not a big deal and it would have a very positive CSF score. Whereas a non-coding RNA can tolerate a stop codon mutation. So one letter can change and add a stop, a stop codon. And that's something a protein really tries to prevent throughout evolution as it'd be very detrimental. And so we can see here with fire, there's no indication in any amino acid is actually being preserved throughout evolution to maintain a synonymous mutation. Moreover, fire is pretty much exclusively nuclear, um, as shown here by these fish, fish images, where it, it, this is the site of transcription here in a female mouse CS cell. 
where the mature transcript ends up. And you can see a lot of it is on X, but um, this picture is blown out and there's still quite a bit of other molecules um, floating around in the nucleoplasm. So there is really no way fire has a chance to be translated. Um, what's also really interesting is fire is the only biallelically expressed long non-coding RNA. So uh, after X inactivation, the cell has undergone X inactivation. You can see two sites of fire transcription and two sites where uh, it localizes to that site of transcription and then a few other molecules um, in the nucleoplasm. So this is some pretty interesting properties, but really just points to the fact that it's probably not translated in the cytoplasm. Abundance is kind of nice if we're going to do biochemical assays and try and figure out what a mechanism of an RNA is. If there is a phenotype, um, it'd probably be nice for it to be abundant. Um, and fire in cells is not horribly abundant. Um, for a linked RNA, it's, it's up in the you know, middle category of, of abundance, but in vivo, it's very abundant. So it's kind of worth noting that RNA-seq or other me measurements um, are quite different between cells um, and in vivo for long non-coding RNAs. So you can see here that actually fire is about as abundant as some of the more abundant um, long non-coding RNAs in vivo. Um, this is an in situ of an early developmental stage of fire expression here. So you can check that box. Human disease is kind of a nice uh, way to think about it. We saw a beautiful talk by Bing Ren where if you focus on human disease, it helps you know, sort of hone in on, on candidates um, that will be important for future studies. And so uh, during this time, the study came out showing that uh, fires are Mendelianly inherited. So that's a pretty powerful thing where they can search for all the mutations between the mom and the dad and a child that has this uh, disease. And they pointed to an amplification of fire. This will become sort of relevant in a second. But it, it uh, resulted in this disease, bilateral periventricular nodular heterotropy with polymicrogia. It's a really fun uh, thing to try and say fast a bunch of times. But it's not a, it's sort of like Bing Ren was saying, there's many mutations in the non-coding parts of our genome that are also important for human disease. And in this case, it's Mendelianly inherited. Since then, um, I've received this email and, and several others from real doctors or MD doctors that are uh, doing more uh, cohorts of families with rare um, brain diseases. And so far, they're all on the brain. Um, and in this case, it was even a more specific mutation. Uh, amplification of exons 3 through 13 in the fire gene was associated with seizures and uh, cerebral palsy. Um, and there's a few other of these kind of emails. So it's sort of nice when we have a, a genetic foundation for why this locus might be relevant to study, whether it's DNA, RNA, or protein. Um, and then RNA-based phenotype has really been sort of, I think, where the field has had a lot of controversy, where you know, a lot of link RNAs have cis-acting DNA elements that the RNA is dispensable. Um, there's some that encode cryptic peptides or the peptides actually doing all the work. Um, so we wanted to see if we're going to find an RNA machine, we should really try and find um, a molecule that functions as an RNA or that the RNA does something itself. And so to take on this challenge, a talented postdoc, Jordan Lewandowski, uh, Chiara Gerhardinger, um, my favorite scientist and our neighbor at, in Boston, Amy Wagers, uh, took on this sort of challenge to understand fire from a mouse model genetic perspective. And so we've developed a few uh, different types of mouse models. One where we deleted the entire fire locus, including its promoter, because promoters can act as cis, act, cis regulatory elements that's been published by uh, the Lander Lab. Um, and also a transgene where we can turn on fire by the addition of docs and add an extra copy and ask maybe mimicking this human disease where if you have too much fire, what happens? Does the RNA, uh, if it reaches certain thresholds of levels, does it cause um, something to go wrong? And then by combining these two models, we can have a knockout and see if we observe a phenotype in the knockout, ask if the RNA is reintroduced, can it fix that phenotype would be a really solid evidence that the RNA itself is acting um, as an RNA machine. And so we first looked at cis because as we've seen in the literature, there's many cryptic cis regulatory elements. I think it's important to point out, this is also the case for protein coding genes. Dynesin one was associated with um, several diseases until it was found that it's actually uh, 
an enhancer in one of the exons of that protein coding gene that's regulating the neighboring gene DL DLX6. And DLX6 was actually the culprit for those um, phenotypes. So uh, overlapping functionalities in mammalian loci are common and not just in link RNA loci. So if you, this is RNA-seq data here from uh, common lymphoid progenitors where we saw a phenotype where mice lacking fire did not produce um, as very many of these cells. So, and looking at the remaining population, we can see we knocked out fire, fire is gone. And this is uh, one megabase upstream, one megabase downstream. And these are all the genes that are in that area. And we can see that although fire was deleted and including its promoter, we didn't see any activity of the other genes that would indicate if there was a cis enhancer or repressor functionality in the locus. And we've looked at this through, this is an old slide, but through many more tissues and cell lines um, and have never seen a neighboring gene uh, change up or down upon deletion of fire. Another really interesting cis property I highlighted earlier is that fire is one of the largest uh, regions of CTCF binding um, as far as density in the gene body um, with over 15 peaks in human. Um, and you can see here, the red dot is fire and we're asking in several human and mouse uh, tissues um, where what locus has the most CTCF and it's between its start and stop. And you can see fire is at the top of that list in both species. Moreover, fire sits right at a tad boundary was probably un not unexpected with how much CTCF it would form um, a tad boundary. Uh, and it sits right here in the middle of it. And if you look at the strength of this, these two tads, this is high C data showing that this part of the X chromosome is interacting within this region, there's a break, and then this region is interacting with itself over here in another topo topological associated domain. And you can see that in both human and mouse, where the fire locus sits is one of the strongest um, TAD boundaries, which is probably due to the massive amounts of CTCF there. And so since we had deleted this whole region and all these peaks, including um, a peak in the promoter, um, we thought, well, maybe this will disrupt uh, chromatin topology and we can start to see uh, what genes are misregulated on the X chromosome. And what you can see here is these same maps showing this interaction domain over here and here and fire sitting right in the middle. And this is a female cell and, and a male cell. And in every variation of the knockouts we've made, um, whether there's an inactive X or not, we've never seen this uh, TAD boundary. Um, change. So this cis property, um, we kind of can rule out as um, the sort of functionality of the fire locus. And uh, we also collaborated with Ginny Lee's lab in Hanje uh, in um, seeing does X chromosome inactivation um, get altered in a fire knockout. And to do this, we used a fire HET um, where we asked if we stain for exist here in green, do we see that the allele where fire is not expressed or the the dark allele here, um, does it uh, prefer to go to the allele where fire is? And the answer was no, that X chromosome inactivation still occurs randomly, um, whether it's on the allele with fire deleted in this case, or if it's on the same allele as fire being expressed. So we can rule out that cis property as well and, and then start to look at what sort of transacting roles fire might have. And to do this, the first place we started with is simply turning the fire up um, by adding doxycycline um, and asking, do we observe any sort of phenotypes upon overexpression of fire? And uh, the first test we did um, was with LPS. And we've done a titration from, in the literature, you'll see very wide variations of ex uh, exposures of LPS. And um, during the review process, we have tried every single variation down to the smallest amount of LPS. And what LPS does is mimics a bacterial infection. Um, and usually the mice get you know, a little sick and they recover and they're just fine. Um, and what we saw here is that in the knockout, the mice were fairly fine with this LPS treatment, even at very low levels or high levels, they survived the infection. And then, um, but if you had added docs into the gain of function model, the mice died upon um, exposure of LPS, even in, in faint amounts and very quickly 
And actually this, this phenotype was discovered by uh, vets in the mouse house um, that noticed that these mice were warm and sort of melting. And so basically that interferon response that Diana presented to us is initiated, but it can't turn itself off. And so these mice overheat um, and essentially melt from the fire. Um, so that's a great indication that the only thing different here we've done is we've turned on an, an RNA beyond its typical levels. Um, and therefore, if you have too much of the RNA, there is a physiologically relevant effect. And it's our first sort of clue that the RNA itself might be doing something. And then uh, this also fits with the disease I was mentioning to you uh, in the brain. And so we've uh, started to look at what happens to the brain. Uh, we have to wait a lot longer in this case uh, during development towards adulthood. But what we see is that if you do uh, overexpress fire, um, looking at this third panel here, that uh, brain cells tend to endothelialize um, and looking into what this exactly is, but you can see holes in the brain. Um, and mice don't have polymicrogia, so we can't really compare the human phenotype to the mouse phenotype, but we do see that overexpression of the brain throughout developmental time um, will, will cause this. And we're also kind of lucky to have some control cell lines where the RTTA wasn't incorporated. So we still have the same genetic background, but um, you can't induce fire with doxycycline and, and did not see this effect. It was only when uh, fire levels were increased. Okay, so just to sort of summarize our hunt for an RNA, and this is one mouse model. We've, we've tried this for several and it's, it's a lot of work, so you can only really pick a few. Um, but we know that it does not function in cysts from the properties we've looked at this far. The fire RNA can act in trans and cause um, lethality upon LPS infection. Um, it's also required in hematopoiesis. Uh, I didn't have time to show that, but basically you can rescue uh, hematopoietic defects we observe um, by reintroducing the RNA into the knockout, suggesting that the RNA is acting as an RNA and in trans. And that, as I mentioned, uh, overexpression is lethal in, uh, upon LPS exposure. So this sort of leads us to our next mission is now that we have an RNA that can do something, what are the genes it's actually regulating? And this became a very interesting journey. Um, it's unpublished and I uh, just wanted to share it with you because several surprises have come along the way. So this is what we were excited about at first. If you knock out fire, this is a volcano plot showing genes that are downregulated and genes that are upregulated. Um, and their p-value is the height here on the y-axis. Um, and you can see fire is at the top of the list as you'd expect, we've removed any potential of fire being expressed. And that's great. And we see 2,000, 3,000 some genes that are downregulated, 3,000 some genes that are upregulated. And so the glass half full interpretation is, wow, fire regulates a lot of genes. Um, the glass half empty is, well, which are these are the original targets and which are these are secondary, tertiary, quaternary effects um, from the removal of fire. And so we wanted to really take a highly conservative approach using all the genetic models we had developed and uh, uh, also doing a time course to see which genes would track with fire throughout its induction time course. So this was taken on by uh, Christian and Erica in the lab in Boulder, where they've induced fire in mouse ES cells. And everything I'm gonna show you um, in this section is from different genetic lines derived directly from the mice, but now we have primary ES cells with these same um, genetics that I just showed you. And the first surprise we had is that if you induce fire, it, it goes off in six hours. So this is uh, the wild type uh, with the transgene. And so as you'd expect, there's a little more than turning the transgene on in a knockout because um, there's still two endogenous copies in this, in this black one. And none of our controls turned on. Uh, they're missing RTTA, but they're the same uh, inserts uh, as shown in these two lines. But what we, what's interesting is if, imagine we did a 12 hour, a, a zero hour and a 12 hour, or a zero hour and a four hour, we would have missed uh, most of the action here. If we compared here to here, we would have thought fire doesn't really get turned on or upregulated at all. Um, so time matters. And I think it's, it's really important to sort of see how transgene induction 
works um, in cells. What's interesting is in vivo, that doesn't happen. Fire stays on persistently and uh, equilibrializes to about tenfold higher than wild type. Um, but in cell lines, or maybe it's a stem cell thing, they figure it out and they turn fire transgene right back off. So we, we made a very conservative approach to this because we're really trying to find the core target genes, not a bunch of genes or pathways or other things. We want to ask, how does RNA actually affect gene expre expression via chromatin? Um, and so we don't need very many genes, but we want them to be bona fide first sort of targets of fire. And to do that, we use multiple uh, different um, genetic lines where we have a knockout of fire where there's an ectopic allele of fire on an autosome that expresses some fire, a wild type where we express even more fire. And then we have controls where the fire transgene is induced um, or can't be induced in the knockout because there's no RTTA and same here. So sometimes it's worth saving these uh, in non-inducible mice models because they can work as good controls um, in the future. So we used a uh, just a simple linear regression model that requires fire or a target gene to behave like fire in all of these genetic models in all the replicates and not being due to docs. So these two lines will tell us what docs is doing to gene expression. Turns out it wasn't much, but we were concerned about it. Um, and also the it requiring this many things to happen um, would be a very conservative approach. And so Michael Smolligan has, uh, time courses are not the sim simplest thing to analyze informatically. And this, uh, this is a really talented student um, who's been working on trying to figure out what these targets could be. And so uh, what he's plotting here is the gene expression changes through time shown here, 60 minutes, 90 minutes, uh, 120 minutes. And a couple of things you'll notice right away is these genes started out not really expressed and they're all going up. You don't see very many genes going down. We, we would have uh, found those genes in the model just as well as genes that are upregulated. So that was kind of our first clue that fire might be sort of activating genes upon um, either turning it back on to wild type levels or even turning it on higher. And so in this model, both restoring to wild type levels and higher levels, this, these genes have to be uh, meet all those criterion. So if we look at the sort of first responders that are in this very stringent um, criterion throughout time, being induced and staying on. They can't just go up and turn off. They have to stay on throughout time too. If we put a, a two-fold change on here, we see that we can reduce this to about 60 genes that are upregulated and 11 that are downregulated. And I still need to ask why there's 11 here because I only count four spots when I was going over this. So, uh, but you can see that more genes are going up than going down uh, upon uh, induction of fire. And this is uh, what these guys look like. Fire is on, it looks like all the time because this is a mix of the knockout with the transgene and the wild type with the transgene. And so we see that in wild type, there is some fire that's already expressed. Um, and these are sort of genes that respond kind of late here and turn up quite high and those that are kind of early on um, in here. But as if this wasn't conservative enough, we wanted to take it a little bit further um, oh, I, first I'd like to mention that one of these genes is ADGRG1, which in humans is associated with polymicrogia. So uh, it's considered the driver of that disease I've been telling you about, and it turns to be out to be one of our top 16 targets um, shown here. This is just sort of validation in a, in a different way. So how could this be working as a transcriptional activator? To look at this, we, we turn to a TACSEQ. I feel like everybody does now. It's such a powerful method. And um, what, what we found right away is that uh, most of the chromatin did not change. We saw very few changes. In fact, 31,000 sites, um, I think there was 60,000 observed in total, but almost all of them did not change. Um, and if they did change, it was a very uh, kind of random way. Um, so we wanted to look and cross what peaks did change and, and with our um, uh, target genes that changed by expression level. 
So this is the attack data shown again in that volcano plot area where um, we don't see chromatin closing. So we would have could have picked that up as well. Uh, we see um, peaks opening up. And some of these peaks you're gonna notice are the same gene names um, as what we had just seen. Um, and so uh, we wanted uh, to cross that with that. And we find that of the 15 um, attack seek peaks that we found changing um, due to fire, um, nine of these overlapped. So we have, can further reduce this set of uh, 15 to nine um, genes that also have attack seek peaks opening up and the RNAs now turning on. And so the, these are these genes and you can see the ADGRG1 again fits this criterion as well. So th this is just sort of raw data of how this conserve approach gets you very clear results. This is um, just normalized track counts here where we can see when we induce fire in this line, the attack peak shows up. And in this line uh, where it's induced, it shows up. And in this case, it doesn't. And this is just one time point. And I, so we have this throughout that whole time series as well, um, which was a lot of data that didn't change, but because we have that time component, it still helped us um, get down to this more conservative sites where fire might be directly sort of affecting gene regulation. And this is ADGRG1 again. Um, so it has a clear induction and a clear opening of chromatin at its promoter upon fire induction. And sort of bringing it back to this polymicrogia here, we know that ADGRG1 um, through many other studies is, is the driver of polymicrogia um, and fire might be um, a sort of upstream uh, role from that where you amplify fire, it's similar to turning fire on or up, could be, we don't know that for sure. Um, but we do know in cells that when you turn on fire, this gene is significantly upregulated um, and not in the control cell lines and has attack seek peaks moving. So we wanna look at this also in NPCs and it turns out we see the same thing. So we got several of the same genes. I'm just gonna talk about ADGRG1, but we repeated this entire time course after differentiating these same, all these genetic lines into um, NPCs, the knockout, knockout control, um, inducible, non-inducible uh, lines. And so this is a pretty robust target. Um, there's other ones, not just this one, but uh, of the nine, this showed up in, in both um, ES cells and NPCs under these very stringent genetic uh, requirements. So to sort of wrap up, I'm, we're sort of putting fire into the list here that we know the RNA can cause an organismal phenotype and we can use those genetics to hone in on what its target genes are. And really we just want a couple good solid target genes to put a reporter into and now we can dissect the mechanism of how fire sort of works. And I think in, in long non-coding RNA field, most studies go the other way where you start um, from cells and move up to an, a model. Um, but now we're really working hard on the biochemistry. Um, I have the data and I didn't, uh, put it together. Um, but what we are just doing now is using um, chirp, chart, wrap, MS uh, approaches where you IP your RNA and ask what are the protein components? Because all of these RNA machines uh, work with protein coding genes. It's kind of the rule with RNA, it needs a protein coding gene to do its function. And so we're starting to assemble what pieces of fire can turn on ADGRG1 and then which proteins bind to which pieces and trying to assemble um, this link RNP um, machine, if you will. And so ultimately we're using this very conservative uh, approach to hone in on functional domains of RNA, um, which we was the case in history for protein coding genes. And I think TERT represents the perfect example where the protein uh, component has three domains, um, and you can read that, like there's a nuclear localization signal, uh, an RNA recognition motif, and a template domain. And so we can kind of read this domain structure as C spot run. The problem with RNA is the same sequence can form these structures, and telomerase is not conserved, or the Turk RNA is not conserved. It varies widely in length and sequence across species, but every species has one. Um, and so what we can we do know is that the structures are required. 
and there's three different structures here. And so this lexicon or grammar is more like reading holograms where there's a there's sort of a more cryptic meaning than our typical word lexicon. And so we're hoping to use fire to try and solve just one of these little hieroglyphs here and which proteins bind to it and how that can affect um, gene regulation. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, the fire squad and all the people that have been working on this um, uh, shown here. And I think I mentioned along the way and Richard Favell for making the mouse all the way back in 2009. So uh, with that, I'd like to thank you and take any questions. Thank you, John. That was an excellent presentation. So we have uh, the first question from Peng Liu and Peng Liu says, thanks for the great talk, John. Is there any way to check whether inducibly expressed fire still purely stay inside the nucleus? Great question. No, it doesn't. <laughs> um, it, it does not have, so that's a, I didn't show that data, um, but we have this time course with fish images too. And um, what we see is really interesting. So in that burst at six hours, fires in the cytoplasm. And when it goes back down, it resorts to about a wild type level in the nucleus. So somehow once the fire uh, transgene gets into the cytoplasm, NMD or something else decays it really fast. So, but it is interesting that once you overload whatever retention system is keeping fire in the nucleus, if you overload it, it will go into the cytoplasm, but as soon as it gets out there, it's destroyed. Um, and the phylo CSF or the coding potential of that transcript um, is almost zero, but to be super extra conservative, we're taking the same thought you had um, and we're doing ribosome profiling and other things to see if it somehow does get caught up um, in the ribosome in some way. Thank you, John. I had a question about the mechanism and whether you had thought of any interaction partners or the different parts of fire that you were intending to look into later? Yeah, so, so the data is all very, very new. We, um, we've been very nervous about doing a uh, chart, chirp, wrap MS. It's very tricky. And you know, Howard Chang and Mitch Gutman have, have really pioneered it. Um, and so we've been doing this throughout a time course with the different genetic backgrounds. So we're taking the same approach of multi-genetic uh, and if you get the same answer across all genotypes, it's, it's probably a good candidate. And we do have a candidate. Um, and I don't know, I, I want to stay away from polycomb, but it is, it's a, it's a polycomb uh, component. But what's weird about that is we're seeing gene activation. Um, so right now we're just at the point of getting these candidates. Um, I, I guess I can tell you guys it's YBX1 and YBX3 um, keep coming up at the top of our list. And and all the different genotypes that we've tested. And um, so now we're at the uh, point where we're gonna try and make CRISPR mutations of YBX1 in these cell lines and hopefully get ahead, see what that does and, and a knockout um, and see how they're affecting this um, gene expression. And also see if maybe if we overexpress some of these proteins, if they can rescue um, the changes in gene transcription. That's a good question. Thank you, John. We have more questions. Uh, Paul Lenner says, great talk. Can you explain the cool LIPS phenotype? Um, there is no uh, sort of IPS phenotype in, in here. The stem cells are fine. Um, and really what we're trying to do is assemble, use these target genes to understand how could a long non-coding RNA affect transcription? You know, we don't have P53 or MyOD here. We have a, a fine tuner of transcription, but we're really curious to use these stem cell models um, to, to figure out what those targets are. And I think when you mention IPS cells, that's a, where we're going as well, is we're trying to find conserved um, candidates. So we're going to try and make a transgene uh, model in human IPS cells and see if we turn on um, the same genes, because every all the data I've shown so far is in mouse. Oh, sorry. So he says LPS. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So it's interesting. So I didn't show a lot of it. Um, it's published, but it's also kind of buried in that paper. But basically, we did a cytokine profile. And um, I'm sorry about IPS, LPS. Um, but 
uh, mm -hmm. the cytokine profile is quite dramatic. Um, that it's, some of these cytokines are supposed to go up and down during the infection. And what we see in the case of fires, they go up, but they can't come back down in time. So we did a cytokine um, trace throughout that whole time course of LPS treatment. And you basically see uh, two patterns, one where some cytokines are doing their normal cycling. And then I wanna say TNF alpha for some reason is turned on really high, stays on, and that's causing the fever or sort of melting of the mice. But we don't know the mechanism, but once we start finding uh, protein partners, then we can start looking in the immune system and seeing if there are different protein partners um, or crossing those mouse models with the knockouts of the binding partners and seeing what happens. Thank you, John. The next question is from Shannon Screener. Can you determine how much of the LPS sensitivity is due to the exact function of fire versus overexpression of double-stranded RNA that might look like to the cell like a viral infection? Yeah, no, that's that's a good question. Um, and uh, we are overloading it. It goes into the cytoplasm. Um, so there are, are those interferon uh, response uh, issues. We did, a reviewer pointed that out too, and we did have some data. Um, once we got into the immune system, I checked out, to be honest, it's too complicated for me. But um, the there is some evidence in there of one of the controls um, that it did, I guess, yeah, but your, your caveat is, is, is definitely um, up there. And I should have shown the hematopoietic data where that wouldn't be an issue where in the knockout you lose CLP production and then you add the transgene into the mom, let the pups live or get um, birth and then you restore the immune um, phenotype. But that doesn't uh, rule out the LPS uh, interferon response. Thank you, John. Matthew Lawrence says, thanks, John, very interesting. Matt. Do the genes slash loci responding to fire harbor any histone marks in wild type cells that predict their responsiveness? No, so they're, uh, they're kind of boring. Um, in stem cells, there's a lot of bivalent promoters and they're pretty much all uh, K27, K4. Um, and the, the only thing we do know is a very significant trend is they're all going up and the chromatin is opening up as they're turning on. Um, but no, there wasn't a defining candidate. Now, again, we're, we took such a conservative approach. We're looking at just a, a handful of genes. Um, and if we look you know, more globally, we might start to see those, those trends. But we're starting to think this might be a regular transcriptional thing rather than a polycomb thing or a K27 thing. Because there, really there's no, oh, I should have mentioned we did K27 chip throughout the entire time course and nothing changed. Um, in any genotype either. So K27 is not seeming to be a global um, thing with fire. Uh, there's several papers out there suggesting that. And um, we just see, uh, at least in the fine tuned thing, that these are just promoters that haven't been activated yet. Fires turns on, they get activated. And so we're suspicious that maybe some transcription factors being brought with fire or something uh, to help activate these genes or blocks a repressor, one of the two. Thank you, John. The next question is from Priyanka Pan. Your 2014 paper about topological organization of multi-chromosomal regions of fire talks about five locations throughout the genome where fire is binding. Did you see any deregulation in these genomic regions as well? First of all, thank you for reading that paper. Second of all, we've, we've been looking at this a lot and the answer is yes. Um, we see uh, PPR1, or we call it peanuts now, um, but it shows up, but it doesn't show up in all the lines in under the stringent criterion we've had. Um, and we further have tried to do some of this co-localization stuff for ADGRG1, and we don't see it co-localizing with ADGRG1. But because of that, and, and you're thinking just the way we are thinking in our next experiments are to do uh, fire, wrap, chirp um, DNA and um, see what sites, how this, where fires, is it actually physically touching the chromatin at these sites? 
and then um, and, uh, and, uh, and other things. Um, the only kind of difference between this study and that study is that was a fire knockdown. Um, and in this case, we're really looking at things that are induced when fire is induced. But that PPR 110 really does seem to fit the bill. Um, whether it's actual physical movement and touching, we, we don't know yet. Thank you, John. The last question is from Peng Liu again. M6A could also signature to trap endogenous fire inside the nucleus? Yes, that's a great question. Um, and we, we don't really have the expertise on um, the sort of RNA modifications, but yeah, it could very well be that when you overexpress fire, it doesn't get the N6 uh, modifications and therefore can get out to the cytoplasm. It also could be involved in the regulation. There was a, a paper um, by Dr. Porman um, from Aaron uh, Johnson's lab and at CU Anschutz that shows hot air N6 methylase status matters quite a bit in cancer, in breast cancer specifically. So yeah, it's something where it's on our mind and it's with COVID especially, it's, it's so many things you can do and so much time, but it's definitely on the list. It's a good question. All right. Thank you so much, John. Thanks for chairing the session and for your excellent presentation.